This is uh, Nathan Hill, who's the Sam Lam Professor in Chinese Studies and Director of the Trinity Center for Asian Studies, as uh, some of you may already know. And he's going to be giving a talk about the syntax of subordination with verbiage and matrix verbs in the Old Tibetan Mayana. Just a, a, a terminological issue to start with. So I call an infinitive when I have a verb uh, followed by the suffix do, followed by a verb. And then I call a verbal noun uh, when I have a verb followed by the suffix par, followed by uh, another verbal noun. So you can see already my kind of structuralist approach, right? Where, where I'm just telling you what the morphology is and how I'm, how I'm saying uh, what I call it. Uh, but let's say pa is definitely some kind of nominalizer. So uh, par is a nominalizer in the affirmative case. So anyhow, this is the terminology I use, infinitives and verbal nouns. And then we're interested in these uh, two uh, verbs, uh, which are to request and uh, to agree. So these are both, both you know, verba dicendi, uh, and uh, we're going to look at their syntax. So, uh, so first, uh, first half is about uh, request, and the second half is about agree, more or less, I think. So uh, subordinate clause is governed by uh, the verb sol, request. Uh, we have in the old Tibetan Ramayana, we have in, uh, infinitives occur in direct speech and terminative verbal nouns occur in the narrative frame. So that's a, you know, I don't know. First, we just observe that dist distribution, which is kind of interesting, right? So all examples of uh, so uh, governing infinitives in version one of the old Tibetan Ramayana so there's about five different manuscripts. I'm not going to go into the whole manuscriptology, uh, you know, protocology side of things, but basically there's two versions of the Old Tibetan Ramayana, and I only read version one because it's the older one. And then, you know, we historical linguists like to read old things. Uh, and then also version two is a copy, basically. Version one with certain kind of editorial changes. So it's it's also a little bit more, you know, you get more one étape de long, right, if you were working on version one. So anyhow, they only occur in, uh, in direct speech. And in most, the speaker is requesting something uh, from the addressee and is saying, you know, please do some action. So here are just some examples. Uh, so I request that you send a letter, he said, and I offer my daughter, Megasena. I request that you accept her. Thus, he brought his daughter and offered her. Uh, and then in example three, I request that you ask them, he said, so these are all requests by the speaker to the addressee that the addressee do something. Now, in example four, the agent of the subordinate noun is not the addressee, but it's generic. So this is Sita. She says, I beg to be taken away from this ugly creature. So you can see, um, you know, so me, uh, chen dile chok du sol I I read it out just so that you are convinced that there's a sol in it. Uh, and that it's uh, so chok du sol. It's a it's the uh, uh, what do I call it? Infinitive construction. Okay, so I think that's interesting. This 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 general one. So maybe if 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 we have to read this fourth example as a kind of passive, maybe we can read them all as passives. Yeah, that's my my conjecture. So we could say uh, request that a letter be sent. Uh, request that she be accepted. And request that they be asked. Where you know, we're, we're, basically, it's a question of what's what what's the meaning of the construction versus what's the meaning of the circumstance, sort of semantics versus pragmatics, right? So I'm maybe suggesting here that in one case the semantics have to be passive. So maybe we can have the semantics be passive in all cases, uh, and that uh, or or generic, maybe I should say rather than passive. Uh, but that 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 you know, pragmatically speaking, when when I say you know here is a glass of water, it means I'm offering you a glass of water. If, if pragmatically speaking, I say, I request that she be accepted, it's clear that, that I'm asking for the addressee to, to, to accept her, okay. So passives are cross-linguistically typical of the indirectness appropriate to polite requests, please be seated, yeah? Uh, rather than saying, please sit down, please be seated is something I could tell you at the beginning of this talk, whereas if I say, please sit down, it's the please is totally, you know, it's no longer polite. It's just sort of passive aggressive, right? Um, so a patient focused meaning 
uh, also characterizes the future stem in general. So this is, you know, I won't go into, but like when you when 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 you form what would be like a gerundive in Latin, uh, you do it with the future stem in in Tibetan. So futures have a kind of, you know, passiveness to them already. So that's kind of circumstantial evidence for this argument that I'm making. So I would say, well, maybe the future infinitive, and by future infinitive, I just mean that the, that the, that the subordinate verb is in the future stem. So future stem do matrix verb. In this case, future stem do soul. Uh, so maybe future in, infinitives when governed by soul is, uh, is syntactically a passive and, and pragmatically a polite request. Okay, so uh, future infinitives of transitive verbs now are passive. So, so I'm looking for unambiguous transitive subordinate verb like hunt, uh, uh, and this makes the, the 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 patient prominence clear. I, I feel like that was a weak transition, but basically, in all these request circumstances, there's there's you know like you know please be seated. Well, be seated is an intransitive verb, and so I I want a transitive verb to have it be clear. Like, is it passive or is it not passive? Yeah. Uh, but now also I'm moving away from with soul. So I've, I've basically, I've, I've had a conjecture that future, uh, future infinitives are passive. And I've, I've, I've kind of motivated this conjecture by looking at uh, the infinitive structure, the, the, the infinitive structure with the superordinate verb, the verb decendi as the matrix verb, uh, soul. So now I look in general, is it true that future infinitives are passive? So here we have example five. This is a deceptive deer, and it is not suitable to be hunted. So, uni du we ridak yin we nyaktu mirung te. So the clause nyaktu mirung uh, is uh, is not suitable to be hunted, where rung means to be suitable. It includes no overt noun phrase. It doesn't say deer. Yeah. Uh, neither the hunter nor the quarry, but just contextually, it's unambiguous uh, that the unsuitability has to do with the quarry. It's not this hunter is inappropriate, get me a different hunter. It's saying this quarry is inappropriate to be hunted. So anyhow, there, it's passive, yeah? Okay, so what about soul in the narrative frame? Everything so far is just in direct speech, right? So in the narrative frame, the verb soul governs the terminative verbal noun and not the infinitive. Naturally, those making the request, those to whom these requests are made, and those who would engage in the requested activities are in the narrative frame. So they're all third person, right? So it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's disappointing, but that's what happens with narrative frames. They're all third person. So uh, nonetheless, we get a variety of co-reference relationships uh, and we can look at those co-reference relationships. Yeah. So basically, when when is it same subject? When is it different? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll just go through some of those. So the addressee and the one performing the requested activity are both the king. So here they say they ask the king to come. So they're asking who, who's coming. It's the king. Yeah. So gyalpo uh, shekpar solne. Yeah. So here you get par rather than two. Right. That's sort of what the whole paper is interested in. Uh, and then next, the one requesting and the one performing the, act, the requested activity are both Lakshana. So here, the brother Lakshana asked to cross first. So, so it's, it's, you see it's different here. We're asking the king to do something. Here, someone is asking to do something himself. Yeah, but the, it's still this, the, yeah, anyhow. Uh, so moving along, uh, request has uh, supernatural qualities. Uh, and three uh, co and three co-reference relationships are not re relevant. So uh, so let's just look at it. They intended to ask that whoever they shot should, sorry, they shot would be hit lethally, but the goddess changed it so that the first arrow they shot would be lethal. So they they wanted you know to to, to have everyone they shoot uh, die and. It, just actually, you only get one chance. Yeah, first first arrow you shoot. So uh, here we're looking at this. Um, so gumpar sorwar. They. This is where it's a uh, to die. So they they the intended is is in the matrix verb. They thought they thought to request that that you know should die if you like. Uh, so 
it's not, let's say, it's this kind of clean co-reference uh, uh, criterion, like is it the person asking who's doing the request? It sort of doesn't, it doesn't pertain because it's kind of in principle, yeah? Okay, so uh, it looks like co-reference relationships are in no way uh, encoded in, in uh, the soul uh, in the narrative frame. Okay, so that's, so, so far so good, right? We just did soul, we did it in, uh, in speech, and we found out that probably the future infinitive construction is a passive. Then we looked at the uh, verbal noun in the narrative frames, and we said, ah, nothing really to see here. Yeah, no, no, no conclusions possible. Okay, now we turn to uh, nang, which is to grant. So nang to grant also governs uh, infinitives and termed as verbal nouns. But the obvious division of labor that we saw with soul uh, isn't going to work. So, so instead, what's going on? Yeah. So uh, the, instead, the present infinitive construction is used when the subordinate verb is intransitive and the sole argument is the same as the agent of nang. Okay, so now it's clear to you, why did I even bother with when I looked at soul in, 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 in the narrative frame? Why was I even looking at co-reference relationships? It's because it does matter with nang. So I've, I've sort of shown it doesn't matter with soul, even though you wondered why I was doing it at the time. Well, it does matter with nang. So um, if these criteria are not met, we instead find the terminal terminative, the terminal verbal noun construction. So the terminal just refers to the case marker, the, the ur at the end of the par, right? So, okay, present infinitive with the matrix verb nang. All examples of nang, agree or grant, uh, in version one of the Old Tibetan uh, Ramayana happen to take motion verbs as their subordinate verbs. Uh, I don't think that's you know part of the construction. But, uh, so nevertheless, we will see that when we look at the distribution of terminal verbal nouns governed by nang, it seems likely that the plot of the story and not some grammatical constraint is the reason why we see infinitives only with motion verbs. The intransitivity of these verbs is probably the salient factor. That's what I think. Although, you know, I'd have to, like, if you want to say, no, 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 it has to do with motion verbs, then of course I have to go and do the philology to find an example without a motion verb, and I won't find it in the Old Tibetan Ramayana. So uh, in example nine, he said, I shall not go and did not agree to go. So uh, what I'm looking at is this sheksu manang no, right? So there nang, he did not agree for him to go with co-reference, yeah? Uh, and uh, and uh, intransitive subordinate verb. Then in 10, it, it doesn't seem like Mahadeva will agree to come. So here we have uh, sheksu nangwa is, is, I mean, and there's more to it for the doesn't seem that, but it's, it's the same basically as nine, right? So then in 11, would you nephews agree to go to Lankapura sometime? So Sheksu Jinang, uh, where G is a question word. Would you agree to go? Yeah. And then the Deva Putras agreed to go. Sheksu Nangpe. Yeah. Okay. So now let's look at other present infinitives. Uh, well, and I should just point out that in this case, in these cases, actually, the morphology doesn't make it totally unambiguous, but Shek is a is a present. So so one thing I'm noticing is that request takes future infinitives and agree takes present infinitives. So so sort of from there, then we're looking at how are uh, future infinitives different syntactically from present infinitives. So uh, other present uh, infinitives. Of the verbs listed as taking present infinitives in an article that uh, me and some colleagues wrote a few years ago that has seemed not to appear correctly in the PowerPoint, uh, uh, we, we added this list. These verbs take uh, future infinitives. These verbs take present infinitives. So I, I checked that list, and, uh, and we only have uh, only one example where it's morphologically unambiguous, which is the verb do, je. Yeah. So here's the here's the quote. The horse head swoosh was cut off. Yeah. Uh, the the demon lost his magical power. He swayed to and fro. This is the climactic scene in the whole in the whole thing, right? Where the, there's the battle between the army of the demons and the army of the monkeys, and then uh, Ravana is invisible, uh, and Rama says, 
oh come on are you such a scary cat you're gonna you're gonna be invisible during this battle and then he says just show me your big toe yeah and so the Ravana says okay fine I'll show you my big toe and then Rab Rama is such a good archer that he calculates you know uh, how to cut his cut his head off from where his big toe is and so this is when Ravana is his his head is whoosh cut off and now he's gonna fall down onto the army so uh, he swayed to and fro and made as if to fall on the army of the men and monkeys. And like in uh, Japanese, I would say, uh, as an auxiliary verb, uh, do in Tibetan can have this function as to make as if, to, to try, if you like. Yeah. So we have this tengtu uh, gel te. So as gel is to fall, gel tu chepa. So to, 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 to do as to fall, to be about to fall. Yeah. He was about to fall, yeah. So co-reference between the subject of the superordinate and the subordinate verb is part of the meaning of the present infinitive construction. So I showed it with none, and then I showed it with this one example we have with another superordinate verb. Uh, and in all cases, the agent of the matrix verb and the sole argument of the subordinate verb are the same. Yeah, so I think that co-reference condition is part of the present uh, infinitive construction. How about verbal nouns? Yeah, because we just did the infinitives. Now you want to know about the verbal nouns. Verbal nouns with nung as a matrix verb. Recall that, this is what I just said, right? But it's still a useful reminder. Recall that present infinitives require intransitive subordinate verbs and co-reference between the matrix and the, and the subordinate verb. The terminal verbal noun is used whenever one of these two conditions is not met. So we have either co-reference with transitive subordinate verb or intransitives, but no co-reference. So let's look at first co-reference, but with transitive subordinate verbs. So here, the speaker, a rishi, rishis are, uh, we translate into English as seer. They're these kind of old men who hang out in the forest, uh, but have supernatural powers. So he agrees uh, to himself, except in marriage, uh, Megasinna, the daughter of Malyapanta. And actually, we got this. We got this episode comes up several times in my example. So uh, Malyapanta is trying to breed uh, sort of supervillains, <laughs> and so he gets this rishi to uh, marry his daughter. Yeah. So um, so uh, so here the rishi says, "I consent to take your daughter as consort," and he says it with. Jeparnang, not Jesunang, but Jeparnang. Yeah, and why? Because it, I think it's a, it's a transitive subordinate verb. Okay. Now, uh, in the next example, fifteen, the addressees, the Deva Putras, are asked to agree to themselves take revenge against the gods. So this is Malyapanta talking now to his uh, to his grandchildren. Actually, uh, he says, "Would you agree to take revenge and vanquish?" The gods, he asked. Uh, and so here's the verb. It's this ka dakparji nang. So remember when he said, Do you agree to come? He should he said sheksu ji nang. And now he's saying, Do you agree to take revenge? He says, uh shekpar with the with the par rather than with the do. Yeah. Uh, so in the first clause of 16, it is both Rama who does not agree and Rama who would rule if he agreed to, if he had agreed to. So he says, e this so it's Lakshana speaking, uh, who's Rama's brother. Yeah, so this is right at the beginning of the story where they're deciding uh, what to do uh, when, I think when the father dies. And so who's gonna reign? Uh, so even if you don't agree to reign, would you allow me to act as minister under, his sh under your shoe? So the shoe is going to reign as king and then uh, Lakshana is going to be the minister. So he says, so here it is again, uh, so it's it's lunpo jipar jinang. So uh, to act to 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 do minister is what it literally means. Minister is lumpo. Jipar is a polite word for to do. G uh, question word nang. So again, a transitive subordinate verb with a uh, with a uh, with a ter uh, ter terminative verbal noun, and a superordinate verb is nang. Okay. So now in a letter to King Rama, Hamana. Uh, excuse me, Hanuman requests that Rama does not rebuke him, does not rebuke, you know, Hanuman. So he says, would you agree not to rebuke me? And so again, you see, uh, uh, ka is to, to rebuke is 
kabapt to sort of descend a word. Yeah. So he says, kami bapa jinang shesolne. So lots of examples. So those were examples of transitive subordinate verbs. Now examples of no co-reference. So the addressee is asked to agree to let the speakers do something. Uh, subordinate verb transitive. So I'm, I'm just, th these examples are not about the transitivity, but, but I still just, you know, will make you aware of it. Yeah. Okay. So the first one, would you allow me to act as minister under your shoe? Oh, yes. I had that one already, but it's an example of both, I think. Yeah. Uh, would you allow us to salute the queen? They asked 19. Now, uh, a demon accidentally asks for the boon of sleep. So the, the demon uh, wants to ask uh, for the boon of eating its enemies, but he actually instead asks to sleep all the time. So uh, the one granting the boon and the one sleeping are not the same. The example is intransitive. So once there was a demon named Many Ears who practiced to acquire the power to eat all fellow creatures, but this is, uh, this is just a long example, so I had to spread it over two pages. But by the power of the gods, a goddess of speech transformed onto his tongue and changed his request into, would you allow me to sleep whence he would sleep all the time? So this is uh, ni par, sorry, ni lok par jinang. Yeah, that's the, the phrase I'm looking for right there in the middle. Okay. Uh, now, in uh, example 22, we, I don't know, it's kind of a fun example uh, for the purposes of this paper because we get both nung and sol uh, and the verb ji uh, du uh, subordinate to the verb uh, nung. And ji is transitive, uh, but the point is that there's, there's, a, that there's no co reference between the superordinate and the subordinate uh, subject, right? So they intended to ask for the power over the three worlds. But the goddess changed this request into, would you grant us power over the gods? And here you see, you get it twice. You get first, Jepar Solwa. That's Sol. And then you get Flalang uh, Wang Jipar Ji Nang. So that's what they actually asked for. Uh, and then because she changed it. So uh, that's, anyhow, that's the example. You know? um, and you'll see that the goddess of speech gets up to all sorts of mis mischief in this text. Yeah. Okay, so example 23, uh, the, the second person addressee is maybe co-referenced as the subject of uh, Jelpar, and it is not obvious that this, I'm all leading up to this example, right? And it's not obvious if Jelpar, which means to meet someone, is transitive or not. So that's the problem with meet, like we all know this, you know, meet can be reciprocal or it can be transitive. It's a sort of, you know, different languages behave differently. So this is where I'm going from kind of, um, Generally speaking, you start with the clear examples and you move to the messy examples, right? But now I have this example where it's not really clear whether there's co-reference. It's not really clear whether it's transitive based on the meaning. But now the construction can tell us, right? Because we've proven what the construction will do. So, um, so the construction, the verb, the terminative verbal noun, means that either gel is transitive, you consent to meet me, or there is no co-reference, you consent to us meeting. So. Uh, so anyhow, you can take your pick, and we would need to do more philology to figure out exactly the syntax of, of gel to meet. Uh, this is where uh, uh, I think Ravana's sister, who's a who's an ugly demoness, uh, is trying to seduce Rama. So she says, "If it were not an option not to meet, would you consent to meeting once?" Yeah. So conclusions, uh, future infinitives constitute a sort of passive that can be used as a polite imperative. Present infinitives require an intransitive subordinate verb and co-reference between the agent of the matrix verb and the sole argument of the subordinate verb. When neither the future or the present infinitive are appropriate, the terminative verbal noun is used. And that's my conclusion. <laughs>